Thank you for coming out for this day. I see a lot of grandparents, parents, people with CF. It's terrific to see you. First of all, I want to start off my talk with a big round of applause for the people who take care of us when we come into the clinic and into the hospital. So I think we should thank the main care team. They're terrific. The second group of people I really think we need to thank are those vendors out there. Without their products, our lives would be much more difficult and we wouldn't be able to make the great strides that we do without what they do for us every day. So thanks. Okay, so my talk has a theme. In the middle of your tables are um, Tootsie Pops. So if you'd like to unwrap one and enjoy it before your lunch, the dietitians will close their eyes so they're not watching. A little bit of sugar never hurt anybody. Um, you can go ahead and start enjoying those if you'd like. How many people remember the commercial? How many licks does it take to get to the center? Excellent, a patient and family-centered care. When I started to think about this talk, I thought about the different layers and the different things that are involved in patient and family-centered care. So I took this bullseye and I um, put some things around it, if you want to keep clicking through it, um, to kind of start to get to the center of what real patient and family-centered care means. So I started on the outer link thinking about drug discovery and the CF Foundation and sort of the national stage of what happens in healthcare in the country. The next level is um, main, the main healthcare system, what's available sort of through Maine Health um, that um, owns a lot of the hospitals here in the state of Maine. The next one was Maine Medical Center itself as a hospital and what's going on there for patient and family centered care. Your own CF clinic where people are seen um, for quarterly visits and the care is provided by a care team and what's happening there in patient and family centered care. And then finally, the parents, spouses, and caregivers. I'm in this loop. A lot of us in this room are probably in this loop. And then finally, <laughs> the last piece is me, myself, and I. We don't like to be, I didn't want to just use me. Me, myself, and I means we have some friends if we have a person, if you're a person with CF. So you're not alone. Um, I'd like to start off with a definition about what patient and family centered care is. And um, if you go to the next slide, Anna, there are um, some principles around that have been developed um, through the Institute for Family Centered Care in, down in Bethesda. And these are sort of the driving uh, principles around providing patient and family centered care. Respect and dignity. I think when we all go into a hospital setting or into CR care teams, we want to be treated with respect and dignity. That we are, um, people speak to us in a respectful way, that our values are are known and important to us if we're of religious, have any religious values, if those are brought to the table, that we're just retreated uh, for the people that we are when we present ourselves to the healthcare system. Information sharing. Information is important. If I'm going to take care of my child or myself, I need to have the information and knowledge that I need to be able to do that. If the doctors and nurses have information or studies that are available, they need to share that with us. So information sharing is sort of a two-way street in healthcare and is really important. And it's uh, one of the founding principles. Participation. This is a big one. We need to be active advocates and participants in our health care and our health care team in order for them to help us needs to be on top of the knowledge that's available to them in, this, in the CF community. So we all need to be active participants in health care whether or not we're health care <laughs> providers or recipients of that care. We all have a role. And then collaboration. We have to work together to get this done. So in our next, our first role, I wanted to talk a little bit about the geo, the political role. If you can keep going, um, and a little bit about the foundation. So I'm going to cover some of the things that may have been uh, covered already, but I wanted to go through. If you can hit the next slide, um, this is CF Awareness Month, and a lot of the walks are going to happen, and a lot of the fundraising is going to happen, and everyone down in Bethesda is gearing up for that, and go team. But I wanted to show you a little bit more than be what's behind all that fundraising and what happens to all those dollars. Aside from finding a cure, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation is also involved in controlling the disease and assuring a good quality of life for the people that have it. This is the team of people that I work with in Bethesda. Um, on the left is Bruce Marshall. He's the Vice President of Clinical Affairs. I work with people who are involved in clinical research, Cindy George, the woman on the right. Um, people who do resources and education, Melissa Chin, who's in the center in the pink sweater. People that work on the CF Foundation registry, all the patient data that's collected. And then people that work on the guidelines um, and the accreditation, the site visits that happen. So I'm part of this entire team of people 
up in my little corner in New Hampshire, I join them every day by phone or online virtually working on the quality improvement piece, making sure that good care is delivered to patients and families, but this is my team that I work with. So a lot of the web, a lot of my work is online and um, by phone, so I'm at a distance. One of the things that the foundation is uh, really involved in is advocacy. You saw that you went and spoke to your um, congressperson. They have made this extremely easy to make government and policymakers aware of what CF is, what the issues are that we face as family members, um, things that need to be changed in legislation around insurance, um, ex access to drugs, in the um, NIH trials, FDA. That's what this whole branch of the foundation is devoted to. If you click on the next one, I can show you that within their website, they have an entire toolkit where you, they tell you what letters to send, how to schedule an appointment, who to call, where to go and access these people. They have templates that are available to people to download, use, fill out, and send, send off to your representatives. Um, I happen to show a picture in the next slide of um, the representative from Bangor. So I, count, I countered um, Josh's picture <laughs> of the other congressperson that you met, and this is the representative from Bangor. He's on the subcommittee for health. So he might be another person that you might want to talk to because you're, he's involved directly in the healthcare at a national level. So advocacy is a great way to get involved. The next one is research. We just heard a terrific presentation by your research team. If you go down, um, if you go on to the CF Foundation's website, this drug pipeline is interactive. You can click on different parts of it if you want to take a look at all the enzymes that are being developed, if you want to take a look at antibiotics that are ongoing, if you want to take a look at any other medications, you can see where they are in the phases of study. So you can use that. They also have on the next slide, um, this is the new Kaleidico Ivy Cafter. This thing, ha how many names has this had <laughs> in development? We can't keep it straight. But this is an actual um, photograph of what the medication looked like. Blue lightning in a pill. That to me was the best day ever when that came out. We were all jumping for joy. I, the foundation was popping champagne down there. This was a big, big day, and they were very, very proud of this. So thanks a lot of you. Um, one of the things I wanted to make you aware of that just came out fairly recently is now you can sign up to have clinical trial information sent to you in email. So when a study comes online, an email will be sent to you to tell you this is the age range of the people that they'd like to enroll. This is the pulmonary function of the, of the, that's required for this study. All the information is available about the study, and it comes right to you. I signed up for this a few days ago. It comes right to my iPhone now. So that I'm not having to go to the CF Foundation website or necessarily call my team or wait for a clinic visit. I can now know, and then I can contact my team. I say, hey, I think Jack's eligible for this. What do you think? So it's a really nice way to kind of push information out and get people enrolled in, in studies quicker. So you can go to the foundation website and look for that. Help when you need it. The other thing that the foundation has is a terrific uh, set of resources for patient assistance. To get, your, get yourself enrolled in Social Security, there's a hotline for legal issues, um, patient assistance with co-pays, help you sort out all that pharmaceutical co-pay structure that might help, be able to help you. They have a lot of resources and people that are able to help answer your questions. So take advantage of it. The website is very dense from the foundation and there's a lot of pieces to it. Spend some time going through it. And if you have questions, they most likely have the answers or some assistance and know where to direct you. The last slide I wanted to show you from the foundation is knowledge. They have an entire library of webcasts that are available on different topics, pulmonary function, infection control, nutrition. Um, they also have um, patients telling their stories about how to take care of themselves, uh, going through transplantation decisions. There's a lot of information that's available. There's also things that you can download to share with teachers, to share with other caregivers in daycare or wherever you may be or at work. So take a look at what's available at some time. Okay, so that's that level. Are you, you, I don't see too many people eating lollipops. Okay, you're supposed to be licking down through the levels. Okay, Dr. Zuckerman, thank you. He's got <laughs> now we're gonna talk about Maine Health. Now, I have to say, I'm treading lightly here because I do not live in the state of Maine, although I did. I, live, I went to Bates College for four years in Lewiston, so I was a resident for four, those four years. 
Um, but it's been quite a while. It's been 25 years, if you can believe it, since I graduated. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what Maine Health could offer you as a person with CF or a family with CF. In the CF registry, we do collect information about um, secondhand smoke and tobacco use. Um, if you look at the bar in the middle, that's 18 to 24 year olds and their exposure to secondhand smoke or smoking. Now, CF is a lung disease. Smoking probably isn't the best idea. I'm not a clinician, but I'll stand up here and say it's probably not a great idea. The other thing that we look at in the registry, if you want to click through, is um, exercise and airway clearance. So how many people here love to exercise? <laughs> no one's raising their hand. You love it, right? You love to exercise. Um, and how many people faithfully do their airway clearance every day? Hmm. Okay, yeah, a few hands are going up. All right, we do collect that in the registry. And maybe sometimes we need some motivation or to find a class or to you know, get involved in something that we love to do to help us keep our airways healthy and to help our families stay healthy. On the next slide, we also collect information about transplantation. These are important decisions at a, at a person's life. A um, lot goes on around making that decision. Do I go for the transplant? Do I not go for the transplant? It's a shared decision. It's a time of a lot of mixed emotions that you might need help sorting through all that. You might need to access the counselor. You might need to talk to other people who've done transplant. So now I'm going to show you. I did a little research. Maine Health is there for you. <laughs> There's actually a lot of services. Your care team is terrific, um, but I think when you go to a care team visit that might be talking about transplant decisions or if you're tired of listening to your team say, you gotta get out there and exercise more or I think you should stop smoking, you can go online at Maine Health and there are some information that you can access yourself about shared decision making, about smoking cessation programs, about exercise programs. You can think, if you want, outside of the box a little bit, or if your team recommends it, and go access some of this information right online for yourself and find out what's available locally in your area and classes that you can sign up for. And then they also have a resource library. So that's available just online from Maine Health. Um, this is another shot of that website for patients and families. I was really impressed with how it was organized, how easy it was to get the information. They had phone numbers and addresses. It was really well laid out and then the shared decision-making piece. That's very unique to have that available um, from a healthcare system, to have that shared decision-making, maybe watch videos of transplantation or other things going on to help you make an informed choice about what you want. So that was really neat. The next level is Maine Medical Center and the hospital leaders. So I wanted to, um, if you could hit the next slide, um, I went into the website and tried to look for Maine Medical's um, mission statement and vision and things like that. I wanted to see how patient and family centered Maine Medical Center was as a hospital. And so this is their mission. They're clearly a teaching hospital and they find caring and educating and research really, really important. Um, but if you go to the next slide, their vision really starts to capture patient and family centered care. And it's putting the patients and families first. What I couldn't find was sort of um, someone on staff who might be in charge of patient and family-centered care or people who could help you or advise you about how to advocate for yourself while you're in a hospital setting or dealing with physicians. And I think your CF um, patient and family advisory group is a good board to make the hospital aware of. You've been really active. I, we call it managing up. You should make your hospital leaders aware of what you're doing um, the meetings you participated in, the websites you've established, the connections you have nationally with other CF family, patient and, pa patient and family advisory boards. Let your leaders know how engaged and active your group is because I think it would really help your entire hospital. When I dug a little deeper, I found the core values of the hospital and it, they look to me a lot like patient and family centered care, the dignity, the respect, the you know, the collaboration and information sharing. They, have the, they, they clearly have the drive to deliver patient and family-centered care. What they might need is some help or a model, and I thought your PFAB would be a good way to let the leaders of the institution know that. So, so enough said. Let's move on to the CF Care Center. That's where I'm more at home and more in my home territory. So if we want to go to the next slide. What um, we've been doing nationally is really promoting uh, patient and family advisory boards to help inform the quality improvement or improve the care that's delivered at the care centers. 
your, your center, I have to say kudos to you, you were one of the early leaders in the country that started and formed an advisory board. New Hampshire has one, um, Vermont has one. I think the Northern New England group really took to this idea quickly and sort of carried it forward. As you can see, we now have um, people who are part of leadership teams at the care center looking at uh, registry data, trying to decide what to work on as a group. Um, we also have some patient and family members who serve as faculty for staff who are new to CF care, maybe doing some in-service training for an inpatient unit. They actually speak about their experiences of care to new providers and what's involved in CF care. So they serve as faculty members. The other thing that we have seen start across the country is mentoring programs for parents or people who are new to CF to be partnered with another patient or family to learn more about the day-to-day -day inner working of life with CF. And so they've called those mentoring programs, and they've trained um, families how to work with other family members or people with CF to mentor them. This has been really actually one of the centers that we worked with has done this with <coughs> teens. So adults with CF can talk about those transition years. Um, and a lot of it's online and by phone and that kind of thing. But it's really helped teens with CF get, you know, they don't want to hear mom and dad anymore. You know, my son is 12. We're getting to that point where, yeah, mom, you know. But I think adults, some really terrific adults, have mentored teens who are struggling. And so um, some centers have set that up. And then the last one is orientation. Um, like I said, new staff in clinic, um, sitting down with a patient or a family member can really help you um, get to know what's involved in day-to-day -day life outside of the clinical setting. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is the registry data. Um, this was something that was put up in, for the first time in 2006. You can go to the CF Foundation website and look at any care center in the United States and see the pulmonary outcomes and or pulmonary measures and nutritional measures for children and adults and then guidelines care. How many times are they coming to clinic? Four times a year, two cultures a year, and then also screening for CFRD. The foundation in 2006 made this data available because they wanted to share information. They wanted that partnership to occur. They wanted patients and families and advisory boards to come in and sit down with their care team and say, what are we going to work on? How can we make it better? There was a lot of fear when I was um, involved in putting some of this work together. And believe me, a lot of the healthcare providers those first years were like, oh no, they're all going to move. They're never going to want to come back here again. And it was the exact opposite. Every patient and family member and healthcare team said, what can we do to make it better? How can we learn from each other? Let's roll up our sleeves and work together. People may change centers if there's an acute issue or go get a second opinion. But by and large, they want to get care where they live. They want to be part of what makes, what makes the improvements happen at their own center. They want to be part of that. So. The other thing that we've done at a center level is made available sort of a framework for how do you involve patient and family members and how do you start improving care? I mean, what's quality improvement? Mary Ellen has been um, a terrific coach for other healthcare teams and how do you get started? How do you make this actually happen? So with her help and the help of um, the team here at Maine who came through one of our early um, learning experiences about quality improvement, we put together a book. The book is all online, all the resources are online, and it's a step-by-step -step process. You can see there's steps. It's like a, a set of stairs. You start small and it moves up the ramp and um, eventually you get where you want to be, a better FEV1, better quality of life, better nutrition. Um, we also created on, our, on the CF Foundation website a toolkit to make this easier for patients and families. Maybe you don't want to speak up when you go to a meeting with your care team. Maybe you're afraid that what you might say might offend them, maybe your care will change. How do you have those really crucial conversations with your health care, with the people who are taking care of you? It's not always easy and it requires some courage and bravery. And we've given some tools and tricks and videos about how other people have done this so that you can learn and maybe share some of that with your team or take an approach that uh, might make you more comfortable being able to do that. This is what our, we have to measure. Everything in cystic fibrosis is measured. Your lung function, your height, your weight. Well, we had to measure the involvement of patients and families to show its impact on a national level. Um, each of the bars is a year. And as you can see, people are involved in different levels. That's why when I put together this talk and I'm looking at this slide, I'm thinking, 
Patient and family centered care happens in many different ways. Some people are members of a QI team trying to improve something, while other people want to just do surveys. I want to be involved in satisfaction surveys and I'm, I'm good with doing that. So I think it's, what's nice to see is it's increased over time, but I like to see the variety and involvement because that means a lot of people are getting engaged in patient and family centered care and improving care. So now what are we doing at the CF Foundation level to um, kind of push the envelope a little bit? Um, this is the team from Vermont. You're going to get to see all over. <laughs> you saw Cincinnati. This is Vermont. Um, we're trying to push the envelope and getting patients to really talk about how to co-design care and what does that mean. So I'm going to show you a couple of tools that we're working on. This is the center in Pittsburgh um, and um, this physician <coughs> said we have to put patients first. If we really want to improve the outcomes, they've got to be right here with us telling us about the experience of care, what it's like to receive care where we are, how happy are they, can they get a hold of us, that kind of thing. So that was a statement that he made. Um, one of the things that we've been encouraging teams to do, this is a, um, the dietitian from Utah and a mom from Utah, is really um, learn from them, interview them. Interview your patients, you know, we come into clinic, you maybe spend 10 minutes with every, each one of the providers, maybe take some time out to really interview them and get their story. Share your stories, they're really powerful in how they can change care. Um, this team wanted to work on transition, and this mom's daughter had just gone through transition. So Katie chose to interview patients that had recently been tr transitioned and what that experience was like. And capturing all their stories, they found common themes that came out from each story about she didn't get the form she needed, the first visit wasn't scheduled appropriately, and just the small details that you may not get just trying to map out a whole process. So she, they spent time interviewing their patients and families, um, put together a presentation, and took it to the North American CF Conference to share with other teams. So we wanted to take advantage of that. We've been promoting um, the tool, interview tool with other teams across the country. This is a document that's called the Five Senses Tour. How many people here have walked through the hospital with your eyes closed? Not many. You can imagine what you could hear. Imagine what you would smell. How many people have stayed in the hospital for 14 days and are really tired of the food that they get? Raise your hands. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. This tour, it asks people to go through, pick one of the senses and walk through your institution or walk through your outpatient setting and mark down what the sounds are. How, the beepers are going off all night. People are knocking on the door. People aren't washing their hands. They're touching all the surfaces. It really lets you get to a level of detail around one of those senses that you may not notice if you're just coming in to do an exam or you're, um, you know, you're worried about your child. This is a neat tour that people have really enjoyed. And some of the teams that have used this, the physicians who are on at night are like, yeah, it is kind of loud here at night. And this person's getting woken up. No wonder they don't want to get up till noon. They've been up most of the night. You know? And I think it's really been uh, eye-opening for people for healthcare providers and patients and families to fill this out because it does change the conversation about care. This is a shadowing worksheet that we've been promoting um, around the country. The, in this sheet, it, uh, the healthcare provider sits with the patient <coughs> and family for the entire visit. So they're sitting on the inside of the room watching what's happening coming in and out and taking notes about how what's happening when they come in. You're taking, you're shadowing a patient and family member through their care experience and writing down what you observe. And that's been really interesting for healthcare teams as well to take on that perspective of patient and family and write down what happens coming in and out of um, the rooms. So those are some of the things that we're asking um, healthcare teams that we're currently working with to use and to find out what's useful to them. Um, this is Bob Bell. How many people have seen pictures of Bob Bell? He's the CEO. Oh, yeah, hands go up. Good. <laughs> well, I got a call one day for Bob, and when Bob calls, I get really nervous because <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> he called me up. He had recently come back from the UK, uh, meeting with the UK Trust, the CF Trust, and he said, Kathy, they have a patient and family care experience survey. I said, okay, Bob. Well, okay, that's good. I think that's really important. We need one here. I said, all right. So 
we embarked on a sort of an 18-month journey, almost two-year journey, to develop and customize a survey that would capture the patient and family experience. We have all these wonderful measures of pulmonary function and nutrition and how the center is doing. We have that center data that I showed you. But we don't have anything that really systematically captures what's infection control like at a CF center? What is inpatient like at a CF center? Um, do I feel confident in the education that I get at my CF center? We have no way of nationally capturing that type of information. So some colleagues and I at Dartmouth set out to develop an instrument and validate an instrument that would systematically capture that. On the next slide, I think I have, uh, this is the report that we generated from the survey. The survey is about currently 30 questions and it asks things about infection control and do you see all the members of the care team when you go in and how confident are you to take care of yourself at home? Can you get, a whole, get the medications you need? It asks a whole variety of questions on the survey. And what we did is we um, validated this instrument and we used, there were 25 CF centers that participated, 500 people took the survey and we generated reports back to these centers. We also involved patients and families in its development. We held focus groups, what's important to you. We put out questionnaires to email listservs, what would you like to see included. So that all that work rolled up into a report back to the centers. We thought maybe the centers wouldn't be too happy seeing what patients and families had to say, because there were also comments. You could write comments about um, your care center. These, all of these centers loved this information. We gave them a short survey to fill out. How useful do you think this is? Do you think it's important to collect this information? Overwhelmingly, they liked it. They liked the reports that we gave them back. They liked the comments that we gave them back. And by and large, the healthcare teams, the healthcare professionals, and the patients and families agreed on a lot of the issues. We need gowns and gloves in clinic. We're not asked to wash our hands. Make sure I'm asked to wash my hands. The issues that came out of this are definitely something that these teams can work on together, and they were really happy to have sort of a, a systematic way to report it, collect it, and then share it back with their institutional leaders as well. So it was a good, a good tool to develop, and I can't tell you, Bob Bell is very happy that we have this. It's now being used as part of the uh, accreditation visits, so uh, when teams come out to see if the center is operating the way it should, this survey goes out to the patients and families, and it's just one more piece of information that they have to understand what care is like at a center. So. Is that so. the only time we can access that? Um, right now, it is the only time. What they're hoping to do is to do it annually at all CF centers across the United States, <coughs> and ultimately maybe put it up with the data that's on the website, but I'm not sure that we're going to actually do that. I think it's much more useful locally to share with providers and with patients and families and look at it with your registry data. I don't think, I wouldn't see this on a website per se. I think it's much more of a local issue and something that needs to be kept that way in accreditation, so that's my hope. So that's the clinic. Now let's go on to the parents and the caregivers. Anna's writing down notes. She's saying, <laughs> it's okay. So patients and families know. Um, I don't know all the people in this slide, but I know many, many of them. And it's been a great pleasure for me as a parent to be able to be so involved with the, um, the CF Foundation and the healthcare teams that I met. The first time I ever went to a national conference, if you ever have a chance to go, do go. Because not only do you have all the care teams there, you also have all the basic scientists there. So I am so glad there are people that love to do that. I get go into some of those sessions and I look at those molecules and I say, oh, I'm so glad you're into it. Good, that's good. Because <laughs> there's no way I could get that. But it's just such a, it's such a um, in, very energizing and invigorating experience. And you walk away incredibly grateful for everything that the foundation has done um, to, to cure and to control this disease. So. I wanted to talk a little bit about this young woman. I've had the chance to meet her on several occasions. This is Tiffany Christensen. Um, you want to click the next? She's written, she's written a couple of books, um, Sick Girl Speaks. She lives in North Carolina. She's at uh, Duke. She gets her care at Duke. She's had two double lung transplants in her life. Yes, this woman is phenomenal. She's amazing. Um, and she's taken on, you know, through her experience and through her double lung transplants, she decided she wanted to be an advocate and to teach healthcare teams how to be 
better providers of patient and family-centered care. Um, so she speaks at medical conferences and at Grand Rounds and different places. And she's just a really lovely, lovely woman. She's written this book and it's really well organized in how to become a better advocate, how to become a better caregiver, how to become a better person with CF, what's really important to you in looking at your values. Um, in this book, I have Midnight at Pizza as the title, um, looking at her caregiver section and thinking about my own experience, she always thought that her dad was never really involved in her CF care. One night she's in the hospital and she's laying there and she's been on antibiotics for a couple of weeks and she decided, oh, I'm finally hungry. I'm getting my appetite back. I really love a slice of pizza. Well, it's midnight. Where are you going to get pizza in North Carolina? I don't know. I've not, I've not been to Duke, but apparently it's a difficult thing. <laughs> So her dad leaves the room and calls a pizza place nearby and says, hey, could you make one more? My daughter's in the hospital. She's really sick and would love, you know, she's finally getting her appetite back. The pizza place not only says, we'll make one. We'll bring over a couple. So they brought over pizza not only for Tiffany, but for the entire staff. You know, they're bringing in all this food. And she realized, my dad may not be here every day with me, but he's behind the scenes. He supports me in his own way. He's there for me. He does the small things that make it easier for me to have this disease. And so I think as caregivers, I look at my own situation. I'm the one on the phone with the insurance company. But dad's there during the physical therapy session. You know, are you plugged in? You got everything you need? You know, it's, you have to look at it as balance. And I think that was a really important message that Tiffany gave to me through that story. Every one of us has a role to help the person with CF. And I think that's important to keep in mind as caregivers. Some of it may not be as visible, but it's there. So one of the golden, the golden rules of caregiving. This was a great section that I thought she had in this book that I really resonated with me. Caregiving is a job, and you need to take a break. You need to reward yourself. Get the babysitter, you know, grandma and grandpa, you know, friends, neighbors. Bring them in, because you do need that break. As an adult, take a night off. You need to take a break. This is a lot of work. Watch for depression. I know, I know many people, there's the hills and valleys of CF, I call it. You know, I have my good days, I sit in my office, I cry, you know, I think we could do better. But you've got to be watchful of depression. Don't stay in that valley. If you're staying down there, get some help. Get some professional help. You've got great resources here in your social workers. Talk to them. It's important. When people offer help, accept it and give them something to do. Especially if you're in a hospitalization, you haven't had a good meal in a while. People love to, do, to cook. They feel good about it. Give them something to do. Let them have a role and let them help you. You deserve it. So give yourself a break. Trust your instincts. If something isn't going right, say something. You know, how many, if you're a CF mom, you just got it right here, right? You know, if something's not right, trust your instincts. Make the phone call. Don't feel like you're bothering Mary Ellen. Call her. That's what she's there for. <laughs> if you don't think it's right, help, you know, go seek the help you need. Caregivers do a lot of lifting, pushing, pulling. Be good to your body. Remember that exercise slide in Main Health? Be good to your body. <laughs> Take a break, yoga, stretching out, whatever it is for you. Be good to your body. Take care of yourself. Because it is a lot of, I mean, that pounding, I remember doing the days of physical therapy. My wrists would hurt. You know, you need to, take, you need to be good to yourself. Um, grieve your losses, then allow yourself to dream new dreams. Uh, in this section, Tiffany talks about um, not having to, you know, having to kind of redirect her dreams of when her health was declining. She didn't get to go to college when, at the same time all her friends did. You know, and that was, that was hard for her. You know, she had to rethink about what was important to her. And uh, she grieved the loss of not being able to go with her friends, but then she had to find a way to redirect her energy and figure out new dreams for herself at that same time, like going to art school or going to a theater class, you know, what was important to her. So you have to grieve your losses and think about how you can adjust and have a new dream. And the last one is seek support from others. There's strength in knowing that you're not alone. I don't need to tell all of you that. You're all in this room. You have a terrific PFAB group. There's support groups I'm sure that you can access. You're not alone in this. We are all here. We all walk. We're all here. Take advantage of learning from others, sharing in their sorrow, and sharing in their joys. So this is a little exercise. You I don't see many lollipops, so we're going to have to break it up with an exercise. <laughs> um, what do you see in this picture? 
What do you think it is? A duck, a bunny? A goose. Well, you're right. It's a bunny and a duck. It's a shared mental model, right? I have another picture for you. This one. Cool. What do you see in this one? A vase or faces? That's right. This is a little easier, right? Yeah. You're right. It's, it's both. Shared mental models are important uh, between caregivers and the person with CF. As a mom, I'm acutely aware of this. My 12-year-old sees the world very differently than I do. And I think when we're talking about things that surround his care, or we're, you know, you're a healthcare provider talking with a patient, you have to kind of get on the same shared mental model. How are they seeing the situation? How are they understanding what's going on? Are they able to see what I'm saying to them right now? Because maybe our mental models about what's important and what I'm asking to do are very different. I think you have to start looking at care that way and situations that way. Take on the other person's perspective for a minute. Take, be a bunny. How does the bunny see the duck? <laughs> How does the duck see the bunny? I think you have to think about that when you're working with patients and families as a caregiver, as a healthcare professional, because you may not see the world in the same way. And that was an important message, I thought. And also taking the long view. Um, this section really resonated with me in the book as a parent now, knowing uh, what I know over the last 12 years. Um, as I think I followed the same journey that Tiffany's parents followed. At diagnosis, there was nothing more I wanted to have than to, for my child to have the best quality of life possible. That was the most important thing to me. But by age six, you know what? You need to learn some manners and <laughs> how to behave and to go to school and to have a normal life. So you set sort of boundaries as a parent and your coping mechanism as a parent is starting to change and you're having, you know, uh, parent, parental experiences of telling them, no, you can't do that. <laughs> At age 12, managing your own illness. How many people have teens? That preteen? Yeah, this is what that is all about, isn't it? Do you, do you, I, I, I don't have too much resistance, but Pulmazine doesn't pour itself is a motto in our house. You know? <laughs> the vest sitting on the floor doesn't shake your lungs. <laughs> So I think it's that transition of self-care that's going on as a parent. And I think, I at least feel strongly that pre-teens, why he can still hear me, is probably the best time. Because maybe 13, 14, 15, I might be totally tuned out by then. So I think that that's important. And focusing on school goals and things like that. Um, finishing college and going to her lung transplant. I think that's important too. Um, she wanted to get any degree and just put off her lung transplant for as long as possible. I think as a parent, looking at that statement, I'm not there yet, but I think about how am I going to react at that time, you know? I think go back to the shared mental model. What's important to Jack? Is it going to, I have to be very respectful of that as a parent, and that's going to be tough, I think. But I want to keep the conversation and the collaboration and the respect and dignity going as long as I can. Um, Finishing up school, we had to move back home to maintain a quality of life. I think of all the adults that I've met in the work that I do, this is a hard step, having to step back so you can take better care of yourself. I mean, we in this country, our whole culture is focused around our jobs and what we, it's who we are. When people ask you, what do you do? You know, that's the first question. And a person with CF may not have a job because their full-time job is maintaining their health. And so I think trying to help people find value in that. Um, if you go online to the Facebook world and the social media world, there's a lot of bloggers, CF patients who are bloggers, because that's their outlet. That's what they feel they can contribute at that point in their disease. And I think we have to find value in that. And then uh, if you get new lungs, well, now what? I'm healthy again. What do I want to do? It's refocusing those dreams. It's a new dream, right? I now have a new lease on life, and what is it that I want to do with this new gift that I've been given? And that's an important stage as well. So what we've done in CF uh, with our work with the care teams is really started to, like I said, I've had the chance to work with some adults to really get at how do we get this information during a clinical encounter or during that transition period from pediatric care to adult care. Um, one of the women I was working with at Pittsburgh developed this sh short questionnaire, it's, a, it's called About Me. And in it, if you want to hit the next slide, um, it goes through 
it's sort of a getting to know you tool. She was brand new to the adult care in Pittsburgh. And yes, they got her volumes of medical files transferred over or the button got pushed and the electronic file hopefully went, right? <laughs> um, she wanted them to know a lot more about her. What, were her. what was her faith? What was important to her, her, her beliefs? What were her goals, dreams, and values? You know, your, your pulmonologist doesn't necessarily know what your aspirations are. This was a way to kind of have that conversation and break the ice. Um, your name preference. My son's name is John, but we call him Jack. And I think those are the little things that sometimes the healthcare providers need to know. What do you want to be called when you come into clinic? Um, desire for level of involvement. There are some people in healthcare that are like, just don't, don't tell me anything, just do it. And then there's everybody that, I need to be part of this decision, I need to read all the literature, I need to read the New England Journal of Medicine article. You know, there's different degrees of people you need to let your providers know kind of what kind of patient are you? Are you going to be want to involved in every single decision that's made? Or do you want to just say, okay, this person's going to be my advocate, or I don't really need to know, I, I'll, I'll respect your opinion and just we're going to do it your way. You know, you have to kind of gauge that level of involvement. Support systems. Um, I know in our clinic, when you're 12 years old, you start to go in the room by yourself. And the moms and dads sit in the waiting room okay, I, I'm fine with that, I think he's ready. Dad is having a fit. <laughs> he does not like this. And I think you have to be respectful of the person's support system. I mean, going to a medical appointment, your gobs of information are coming at you. Maybe this person wants to have their mom or dad there or their spouse or partner there or their friend there to help them with this information. So I think rules can't be too rigid because maybe they won't get everything unless that person's there engaging their support system and it's got to be a healthy support system. Um, stressors or worries, what freaks you out when you go to the hospital? How many people hate needles? You know? Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's a good thing to tell your providers. I hate needles. Can I have the Emla cream please? You know, it'll make it go a lot smoother. I think you should be clear and honest with people about that. Um, activities that the patient enjoys, are you a skier, are you a hiker, do you like to sail, whatever it is. And then special requests, like please don't call me at work, please email me instead, um, particularly if you're an adult. You know, I mean, how many people want to field calls from your care team at work? Maybe that's not appropriate. So writing that information down, um, they thought was important. Anything like that or special requests. That was neat. Okay, so now we're on to the me, myself, and I. You ready? Okay. How many people have seen this form? You have? This is from your center. Okay. Raise your hands. <laughs> it's old. Okay. It's an old version. That's the old version. I'm sorry. I, I don't have the new version. Oh, I better get out, get out there and get the new version. Um, this is a care plan from your center. This is what you get to summarize your visit and your goals for the next visit and all the information that you're given. If you want to click to the next slide. And this is you. So you have, I don't like the word adherence. I'm just going to say it right out loud. At least they don't call it compliance anymore. I like self-management because when I, I'm a fan of Norman Rockwell and I see the care plans that teams are talking about and collaborating with patients and families. And then I see this little girl or this little boy who looks in the mirror every day and has hopes and has dreams, wants to be treated with respect and dignity, maybe want to be involved in every decision. This is who we are. We're looking in that mirror and we have that care plan with us, right? So we want to take care of ourselves and we want to fulfill ourselves as people and all our dreams. So. Self-management is the new term, the new word for adherence. What makes self-management complex? Um, the research folks showed you some data about refilling that Toby and how it relates to maybe having worse lung function. This study uh, out of Hopkins looked at what are the barriers. They interviewed 25 uh, adolescents and adults with CF. What gets in the way of you being able to manage your care at home or by yourself. I listed these in order of response. 60% of the people that responded to this said treatment burden. I've got my inhaler, I've got my Toby, I've got my Pulmazine, my hypertonic saline, my enzymes, my insulin. Oh, good Lord. 
treatment burden is huge. That was the number one reason. Mm -hmm. Did that include cost? No, nope, it was just the treatment itself. It's the actual, there's only you know so many hours in a day, and the next one was competing demands. I gotta go to school, I've got a job, my friends are calling me, I wanna be like everybody else. It's the, that also is 60%. So I have to think that it's trying to have a life with CF and trying to get all these therapies in. I do think cost is an issue. I, I honestly do, and insurance is an issue and all of that, but that set aside, the number of things and the number of hours spent in treatment and then the competing demands was what pulled these people into, into selecting these categories. Also forgetting, that came in at like 56%. How many of you forgot to brush your teeth today? Yeah, but how many forgot to put the vest on, right? It, I think forgetting is okay for like some reasons, but I have to think to myself, really, it's sitting there on the floor, you know? <laughs> I don't know, in my house it is. So I have a little trouble with the forgetting one, but anyway. Um, no perceived benefit. This one I could kind of understand because, you know, if you're feeling good and why do I have to inhale all this stuff? I feel great today. I went out for a run and I coughed up all this stuff and I feel great today. So if there's no perceived benefit of putting on that vest and inhaling that medication, how likely are you to, for, to do it? You, I can't believe you forget. You just don't want to do it. <laughs> That's the mother in me. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, fatigue. Fatigue was the other one. Um, you get tired of it day after day, seven days a week, doing it two and three hours a day. I mean, how many people want a vest vacation, you know, and just to do something else or not have to haul it with you on vacation or camping or biking or whatever you're doing? You know, it, people do get tired of doing this, and they did say they did get tired of doing it. About 50, 50 so percent said that. And then embarrassment. <laughs> I don't want to go to the sleepover party and bring all my stuff with me, or I don't want to have to have my compressor with me when I'm going to my dance recital. There's a lot of that. Um, or doing some treatments in the middle of the day in your office. You know, do you have to excuse yourself and go into a restroom or somewhere or do it in your cube? I mean, it can be embarrassing to say, I have to do some treatments right now. So that was the other reason that they gave. Self-management facilitators for every, you know, there's pros and cons to everything. What motivated people in this study to be um, adherent or self, do better self-management were clinic visits. They didn't want to go to their care center and not having done their treatments or having to admit to their healthcare team that, oh, I didn't do my treatments. So if they had an upcoming appointment for a clinic visit, oh my gosh, everything was full guns ahead. They did all their treatments. Yes, of course I did. Um, support and reminders. Smartphones are lovely things. You can set them to ring when it's time to do your treatment, set up your schedule. Um, the support and reminders are important. Some of the adolescents that um, another researcher have at, have, uh, has, has worked with, they, as much as they complain when they're teenagers about mom and dad nagging them, they actually really like it. And adults will tell you that. It was my mom that nagged me, that got me through that difficult period. I only wish I had listened to my mom or my dad when I was younger. So that nagging and support, sitting with them in the room, you know, when the vest is plugged in, watching a program together, or being online together, or just doing work, is important, and being there, in addition to the smartphone that reminds you that it's time to do it. Perceived health benefits, wow, if you're taking that blue pill, I bet you're taking that blue pill every day. There's no way that blue lightning, people who are on it aren't taking it every day. If you feel like you're getting something out of a treatment and you're f able to breathe better or you're gaining weight, you're much more likely to do it. And that's what this bared out. Ease of completion. This is, you know, the tip, the little um, dry powdered stuff. I can't wait for that to become available because I think the self-management, ability to do something in 10 minutes versus lugging around all this equipment, cleaning it, keeping it cold, all the medication cold, is difficult. I like the. I like this. They're smiling. Yes, I get it. I see that. The ease of completion. How many people lo love boiling your nebulizers? You know, I mean, this stuff is a lot of work to take care of. So the easier we can make it, the much more likely people are to be able to self-manage. Habit and routine. 
I know in our house we have like we have it down to clockwork you know up in the morning before school after school you know it's just part of the day it's it's just part of our life and we try to figure out when it happens and where it happens but it's really about being making it a habit you know and and there'll be days our um, our um, best time is linked to TV time and I'll tell you that's a good thing well, I haven't done my vest today. There must be a program on. You know, I'm thinking, what's on tonight that you want to watch? You know, so it's making it part of that habit. And then the distractions and rewards um, are also facilitators. You need to be good to yourself. Reward yourself for getting all your treatments done. You know, go out on a special date night or, you know, have something fun for, with your child, some special time alone. Hey, you did all your treatments this week. Let's go to a movie. You know, make, build in some incentives and rewards. And then also guilt. Um, a lot of the adults and adolescents said, you know what, my mom, my dad, my healthcare team, they're all really working hard for me to have a good life. I feel guilty if I don't do my treatments. I feel bad when I don't do them. So guilt was a good facilitator, like, wow, I really got to step it up here. And that's what they reported. So I'm going to close now, um, back to our principles. And I have a <coughs> couple of questions. Can anyone tell me how many licks it takes to get to patient family centered care? Did anyone bite the candy to get to the center? <laughs> you did? Okay. Right. Right. And along the way, I hope that uh, all these levels, that, they're, um, that you, you should know that you are treated with respect and dignity. Information, sharing information both ways is really, really important. Uh, participation is important. Be active as an advocate at a national level. See your congressman. Get involved in your PFAB here. Whatever level you feel comfortable, get involved. And then, you know, the self-management piece as well. And then collaboration. And then I just have one closing thought. I'm going to flip it ahead. Regardless of which way we do it, I think that we all need to get involved because the healthcare system and the people that we love aren't going to get the care they need unless we do. And I really think that's important as uh, people who are fighting this disease to do that. So I just wanted to, to thank you. And thank you for all that you're doing. Thanks.